Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Jeb in Flow on the Street Parking Podcast channel. Good to have you here. So today I want to talk about Vegas, not the place where whatever happens there stays there. In fact, just the opposite. Uh, the Vegas nerve in your body. Whatever happens there does not stay there. It in fact affects so many other things that are going on in your body. So I want to talk about this one nerve and what it does, some of what it does, how you can measure the amount of activity that is happening with the vagus nerve, and then how you can stimulate it to increase or sort of normalize the activity of the vagus nerve. Basically what this nerve is, it starts in your brain stem. So like just at the base of your skull and it goes all the way down, like through your throat and there's a nerve plexus in your uh, chest that it runs through, um, in your gut and a lot of different places along the way. There's even some little nerve endings that attach, um, that go into your ears. So the vagus nerve is a mainly like a, a parasympathetic activator. And what that means is your, your parasympathetic nervous system is the one that is responsible for rest and digest. So it's the opposite of fight or flight. So if you can stimulate the vagus nerve, it's a good way to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. So just by knowing that that is rest and digest, there's two things right there. It can help you relax. It can help you come down from a very heightened state and it can help you with your digestion and it can help really kind of regulate a lot of the other functions in your body. Just a little side note, they named it the vagus nerve because I think it's Latin, but vagus uh, comes from a Latin word, which basically means vague or wandering. People started, they found this nerve and it just like kept going and it just sort of wandered throughout the body and kept touching on all of these other places in these other organs. So it's a very, very important nerve. Um, some of the things that it will have an impact on. And I know last week we talked about sleep. I think you're going to see a lot of parallels to this. So the vagus nerve can affect your digestion, your immune response, your breath rate and the depth of your breath. Uh, inflammation, the detoxification of your liver and kidneys, which is hugely important. Uh, another thing I thought was interesting was the opening and closing of sweat glands. Some people sweat a lot. Some people don't sweat at all. And I think that for those people that might just kind of be normal, but it could have an indication of your vagus nerve activity. And especially if you go from, well, I never really sweat very much. And then all of a sudden I've sweat like crazy or vice versa and not much else has changed. It's not like you moved to Florida or away from Florida or something like that. Um, so if there's a change in the amount of sweat that you are doing, then <laughs> that could, uh, that could mean something's going on with the vagus nerve. And, the, the two things that I thought were kind of interesting as far as the list that I just said was breathing, obviously, and inflammation. And so inflammation, as I've mentioned, is important. It's an important process in the body when it happens for small amounts of time in response to things like exercise. And even when, when you get a little injury, there's this inflammatory period where your body's trying to protect itself from further injury. So that inflammation actually is kind of good. It's, it's part of the healing process, but 
sustained high levels of inflammation over time is bad. And that can lead to all kinds of stuff, everything from Alzheimer's and arthritis, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So if we can reduce inflammation, we can do a lot for our health and for our performance. One thing that I think, I mean, this nerve is crazy, but, but one thing I found was really, hopefully you'll agree with me on this, but I thought was just crazy is that, so you've got this nerve, right? And it starts in your brain stem and it goes down through your body and it connects to so many different organs and little uh, nerve centers throughout your body but it is 20% of the activity in the vagus nerve is what's called efferent and 80% is afferent. And what that means is efferent nerves or neurons are um, basically signals that, that go away from the brain. So when your brain sends a signal to your body, it's using efferent neurons. When your brain receives a signal from your body, so when signals are going from your organs up to your brain, those are afferent or afferent. I don't know. It starts with an A. So basically this nerve, 80% of the activity is your body telling your brain what it needs. And what I find, just first of all, I think that's interesting on its own, but what I think is really compelling is that we can manipulate a lot of the stuff that's going on in our organs, sometimes easier than what we can manipulate in our brains, especially when you're talking about the brain stem. The brain stem is responsible for signaling a lot of the autonomic processes that happen in your body, the, the automatic ones, the things like, um, like breathing and heartbeat and uh, blinking your eyes and things like that, that you just, you don't tell yourself or think like, okay, now I'm going to blink. It just happens. You do it without thinking. So where that nerve starts is really where a lot of things that just happen on our body without us trying to make it happen. But if you can, obviously you can do certain things for your digestive organs by what you eat and how you eat. But even certain ways that you move can stimulate different organs and the ways that you breathe can obviously send some signals up to the brain through the vagus nerve to then create this kind of feedback loop. So if you are breathing a certain way, it tells the brain, hey, this is the current state of my environment. I need you to either raise my blood pressure and my heart rate and dilate my pupils and get me ready to go fight this tiger, or, hey, everything's cool. Let's downregulate. Let's slow down our heart rate and um, let's, let's get into kind of rest mode. So I, I want to give you just a couple of examples of some of the interaction that happens up and down the vagus nerve from the brain and to the body or vice versa. So um, satiety, right? Feeling full. That is a big one. When your gut gets enough nutrients, it signals to the brain, hey, we are good. We don't need any more. If that signal gets fuzzy or doesn't actually even happen, we just keep eating. So um, one example of poor vagus nerve activity could be a poor satiety signal or even reflex. And how that kind of happens starts actually with the very first stage of digestion, which is chewing. 
right? You put the food in your mouth and you start to break it down. The only part of your body that has teeth that can actually smash and break down through force food is your teeth. And we live in a time where we're always in a hurry and we sometimes don't eat uh, frequently enough. So we get really, really hungry. You just start shoveling food into your face and you barely chew it and you swallow it. And that can throw a lot of things off. So when you chew, not only are you breaking the food down, but you have these little taste buds on your tongue. Those taste buds get a feel for what's going on with the food. And they signal to your brain, hey, this is um, basically like carbs or fat or protein. It's not telling them exactly that, but it's giving your brain a signal to then tell your gut how much stomach acid and bile and other things need to be released into your gut in order to break down what's coming. So it's crazy. Your, your stomach will actually release different amounts of different substances to break down the food based on the food that you're eating. And if your brain doesn't get a clear idea of what that food is, then those levels might get thrown off. And then you could have things like indigestion, inflammation in the gut, and all those other really gut-related nasty things that are really uncomfortable. So chewing super important. Um, but then, right, well, the body needs micronutrients, macronutrients. I don't want to get too sciencey here, but I think we're kind of going down that road anyway. So here we go. But I think we all know, right? You need fats, you need proteins, you need carbohydrates. And then there's micronutrients, your vitamins and your minerals. And those are really important for regulating a lot of the processes that happen in your body and allowing the processes that, that are involved in breaking down those macronutrients too. So vitamins and minerals, super important. How that stuff gets absorbed into the blood is based on the microbiology of your gut. If none of that stuff is, is working properly, and if the messages are not being sent or correctly sent from the, the gut up to the brain and vice versa via the vagus nerve, then it, it essentially creates a stressed out state in the body. And stress causes a lot of destructive things to happen. So breathing is a huge, huge thing. So I kind of already talked about it a little bit, but if you breathe high up into your chest, right? So when you breathe, your chest lifts and your shoulders lift and, and like your belly sucks in, you're taking shorter breaths and you're probably taking more frequent breaths. And when you take shorter and more frequent breaths, you're stimulating your sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight stage. And that releases everything from epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, and cortisol. And those things are valuable. They're valuable in certain scenarios. But chronic levels, if they're chronically elevated, not a good thing. If you breathe down into your belly and you use your diaphragm and you take longer breaths, bigger, deeper breaths, and even if you were to extend the exhales longer than the inhales, then that stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which allows you to relax, to relieve stress, to lower cortisol levels, lower the adrenaline, and that is really, really important, especially if you are somebody that regularly elevates those things, which is a good thing to do, but you just don't want to keep them elevated. So just like we train in a high intensity scenario, we also need to train being able to put our bodies into a really chill, low intensity kind of scenario. 
Now back to the gut. I want to do some more research on this and do a more thorough gem and flow on this because it's so fascinating. But just to give you an idea, this is crazy. Your, your gut, your intestines, your stomach, all that, right? Has 100 trillion bacteria in it. There's different estimates because the, I don't know how they go through the counting process, but compare that to, that's like 10 times more than all of the other, all of the other cells in your body. So to put that in another way, you have 10 times more bacteria in and on your body than you actually have human cells. 90% of the DNA in your body is not human. So what really are we if we're not just hosts for these massive ecosystems of bacteria? It's crazy. That bacteria can influence how the human parts of your body actually work. There's so much more of it. So if we can get to know what's going on with that stuff, I mean, there's just a lot of opportunity and potential there to, to change, to improve, to influence what's happening in the human part of our body. Only 10% of us is human. That's nuts. Anyways, that's a little bit off topic. So we'll keep things pushing. Um, now chronic inflammation is probably, it's one of the most common signs of ineffective nerve signaling, signaling from the vagus nerve. And it can play out in terms of, um, like an imbalance in, in the microbiome of the gut and inflammation of the gut. And it can be, you can feel it in your body anywhere from like arthritis and, and a lot of joint stiffness and that kind of thing, all the way up to full blown autoimmune diseases. And if you have an autoimmune disease, I can't tell you whether or not it was because your vagus nerve, you know, wasn't acting right. There could be a lot of other things going into that. So please don't think that I'm telling you hey, this is your fault because you messed up your vagus nerve. But improving and stimulating your vagus nerve activity could provide some relief and some help. So how can we measure without a bunch of crazy expensive diagnostic equipment? There's a couple of things that you can do to just measure and, and get a feel for what's going on with the vagus nerve. Number one, you can take a look at your heart rate, your heart rate, uh, resting heart rate and your heart rate recovery. So average kind of healthy resting heart rate is 50 to 70 beats per minute. So if somebody's pretty active, you know, athletic, you work out regularly, fairly low stress, it's probably going to be in that 50 to 60 range. If you are fairly healthy, but not super active, then maybe it's more in that 60 to 70 range. 76 BPM, your risk of heart disease like goes through the roof. So it's a, it's a very small window from when you go from healthy to like, whoa, we got to do something about this. But you can take a look at your resting heart rate and the best time to do that right when you wake up in the morning, before you even get out of bed, just take your pulse and look at it and see what your heart rate is. And if it's over 70, then perhaps there's some manipulation that we can do via the vagus nerve to help with that. Um, now, after exercise, there's another cool thing you can do, heart rate recovery. After exercise, your heart rate should drop by 12 beats per minute every minute. 
So you can test it right after you finish working out. Maybe your heart rate's like going crazy, um, 140 BPM, something like that. And then you can test it again in the next, um, after a minute, test it for a minute or 30 seconds and double it, whatever. And see if it is now, um, what did I say, 140? So 128. And it should slowly it decrease. If it's taking longer than that, then um, might be an indication that there's some vagus nerve activity that would require stimulation. And then the last one uh, is the sesame seed test. And you can DM, DM me if you want more details on this, but you might be able to infer from the sesame seed test that you're basically eating a spoonful of swallowing, really, a, a spoonful of sesame seeds and seeing how long it takes for them to show up on the other end. And the window for that should be 12 to 20 hours. Less or more than that, probably some issues in the gut microbiome. So those are a couple of things you can do to just measure, to just get a feel for, hey, what's going on? Now, in terms of what you can do to improve your vagus nerve activity, shocker, breathing, regular exercise, yoga, mindfulness, meditation, cold exposure, uh, laughter, positive social connections, all of these things are really good. So if you have that in your life, that's great. Now breathing, everybody breathes obviously, but not everyone functionally breathes. There's this, I, there's this paradoxical breathing, which is like we go through our work day, but for some reason we're breathing like we are in a survival state. That's not good. You take over 23,000 breaths a day and probably 7,000 of those, something like that, is, is when you're sleeping can't really control your breathing while you're sleeping. If you have good sleep habit or good breathing habits, then hopefully your breath will be better when you're sleeping. But if you have poor sleep habits, even if you're trying or poor breathing habits, sorry, uh, during the day and you try to improve those, chances are during the night, you might kind of revert back to some old habits. So it becomes even more important during the day if you have some paradoxical or dysfunctional breathing patterns to really get on top of that and try to improve that. One of the best things that you can do is set reminders for yourself to just breathe. You can just tell yourself, set, set a little reminder, hey, time to breathe. And you can take five minutes to really deliberately focus on breathing down into your belly. So using your diaphragm to contract and expand your belly and then breathe out through your belly button, go in on the exhale and out on the inhale. If you keep your mouth closed while you're breathing and you can get into the habit of while you're working, going about your day, you're only breathing through your nose, that's another good way to sort of uh, improve your, your breathing functionality and get the vagus nerve kind of starting to come into the mix. Uh, but breathing is very, very important. And all, the, all of those things that I mentioned will help. But if, for example, you're doing yoga every day and you practice your breathing and you're having a really good time, but you are eating a bunch of like really terrible food every single day, your gut is still going to have problems. And probably all of that, those nutrition choices are going to seep into a lot of other areas of your life, physical and mental and emotional and social. So, so it's kind of like, you got to swore to stay on top of all of this stuff. It doesn't all have to be perfect, but 
if you really are just terrible in one area, uh, being good in all the other areas isn't going to fix that. So the action item for this week, I think, is really, really cool. And it's a two-parter. It really would be like six minutes total every day. So not a big commitment. Five minutes of diaphragmatic breathing. And what that means, it, it takes practice. It's really hard for some people. It took me a long time to, to kind of figure it out. So if it doesn't happen right away, don't get frustrated. But what I want you to do for five minutes, try to get to where you can slow your breathing enough to where you're taking five to six breaths per minute. So in five minutes, it's like 25 to 30 breaths. 25 to 30 breaths. If you're taking 23,000 of these things a day, 25 to 30 with some focus and attention, not a huge commitment. So you can definitely do this. What I want you to do is take your hand over your belly button. And as you breathe in, try to push your belly button out into your hand. And breathe in really slow. Try to count to four or five. Once you've breathed in all the way, hold your breath. Hold that retention two to three seconds. Then on the breath out, slow it down even more. So if the in-breath, let's say the in-breath was through your nose and that was four to five seconds, then make the out-breath six or seven seconds. So you breathe out for a little bit longer. And when you breathe out, breathe out through your mouth. In through the nose, out through the mouth. When you breathe out, hold your breath on the out for another two to three seconds. So you inhale through your nose, four to five seconds. Hold it two to three seconds. Breathe out through your mouth for six to seven seconds. Hold it for two to three seconds. Do that for five minutes. See how it feels. You can check your resting heart rate before and after, see what happens with that. It's pretty cool. So I know I've given you guys a lot of breathing related action items, but your breath is so important and it really influences so many other things that are happening in your body and your mind. If you can get control, if you can master your breath, you can master everything else. So that's really, really important. So take five minutes. And, and play with that. And then the other one minute is cold exposure. I've been doing this for a long time and it is a game changer. It's only one minute. So we're gonna start real, and you're gonna build up to a minute. Take a shower, when you take your shower every day. On day one, last 10 seconds of your shower, Turn it to cold. So take your shower, take a few deep breaths before you do this, even turn it up to like even hotter if you want. And then for 10 seconds, you're gonna turn it all the way to cold, deep full breaths for 10 seconds, just feel the cold water. Day two, you're gonna go to 20 seconds. Day three, 30 seconds and you're gonna build all the way up. So on day six and on day seven, one minute. The last minute of your shower, turn it to cold, breathe, and like be in your shower. Like the water is on the back of your head and your neck and your shoulders, not your big toe, okay? So make sure that you're really in the cold. And personally, I think you're gonna really enjoy it. It doesn't actually feel cold. If you can focus on your breath, when you get out, it's very rejuvenating and it feels really good. I think you're gonna enjoy it. So just try it. It's one minute of your life, not even that every day for a week and could encourage you to maybe explore that type of stuff a little bit further. Cold exposure has been a game changer for me. We're just gonna start with one minute for you. So 
play around with, experiment with, measure, stimulate that vagus nerve. Let me know what you think. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I love you, and I will talk to you soon.